Good evening. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Seat. I'm the director of the National Portrait Gallery, and it's my um, privilege and joy to welcome you here tonight. You know, we are the place where we tell the stories of individuals who have made or are still making a difference. And this evening, we have the honor of learning more about one of those remarkable individuals, Maya Lin. This program is in conjunction with our exhibition, One Life, Maya Lin, that's on the second floor. And it's an intimate visual biography of the extraordinary artist, architect, and environmentalist. We're honored to tell the story of Maya's life and career through the exhibition and now through this conversation with the curator of the show, Dorothy Moss. One Life exhibitions trace the arc of a person's life and we see how in this case, her early influences as a child of Chinese immigrant parents in rural Ohio shaped Maya's vision. Her father was a ceramicist. And if you get a chance to see the exhibition, there's a beautiful example of his work in the show. And her mother was a poet who nurtured her and her brother Tan's intellect and creativity. During the early years, her commitment to history, human rights, and the environment were developed. Playing amidst the sandstone cliffs and mossy banks and forests of Athens, Ohio, Maya developed a deep love and respect for the natural world. Her projects are rooted in empathy and they encourage us to think deeply and connect with others and expand our perspectives. They also call us to action. As the 40th anniversary of the unveiling of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is upon us, when Maya Lin was thrust into the public eye as a 21-year-old Yale graduate who was forced to endure sexism and racism as she navigated her suddenly public identity, we're thrilled to celebrate the profound contributions that Maya has made to our understanding of what a memorial can be and what she describes as an anti-monument. Her focus and perseverance during that time is a lesson to all young people today. We are inspired by her subsequent extraordinary contributions to art and architecture globally. We also celebrate her ongoing work as an environmental activist who is engaging our visitors on the most personal level with her What is Missing Interactive, which asks our visitors to share memories of places in their lives that have been altered due to the lack and loss of biodiversity. If you've not seen the exhibition, it's on our second floor, as I mentioned, and I invite you all to visit. It will be on view and through till April the 16th next year. I should mention too, we're so grateful for the support that we received for the exhibition from the Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Gunter and So Chen Young Sumner Endowment. The Portrait Gallery also received funding from the Asia Pacific American Initiatives Pool administered by the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. And now I want to invite you, Dorothy Moss and Myelin up onto the stage. Thank you, Kim. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you. It's great to see a full house. We haven't had that in a long time here. It's wonderful. Welcome. Um, I am honored to be here with you, Maya. We've had a fun experience working yeah. together yeah. on this exhibition. And the fact that this event was, is full and that there was a wait list for it um, and oversold uh, yeah. by weeks shows that people adore you <laughs> and are inspired by you. And, I get to witness this daily um, in the exhibition where we see um, so many young people participating in the interactive, um, sharing memories on the wall of what has changed in places they love and thinking more deeply about what they can do to make a difference using solutions that you provide. Um, and it is especially inspiring to see how the young people respond to your perseverance throughout your life, especially during the time of the building of the Vietnam Memorial, and to your extraordinary career, which balances art, 
architecture, and what you describe as memory works. So let's begin with portraiture, since we're here at the National Portrait Gallery. And the way that I met Maya was in 2014, we decided to commission a portrait of her for the National Portrait Gallery's collection. And this is always an interesting process because it involves balancing uh, an artist with a subject. And there's a lot of negotiation that happens there. <laughs> uh, so I went to Maya's studio and she welcomed me in. We had some tea and I said, I have a great idea for a portrait of you. And I started to describe a time-based media portrait. And she said, no, no, no. You, have to, you have to go into detail. It would, re it would require you lie down on a flatbed, full-scale scanner, and get scan quarter inch by quarter inch by quarter inch. And I'm like, no, that, that's not gonna happen. But I, I told, yeah. So I told Maya backstage what I learned in this conversation. I was kind of getting defeated because I thought, okay, bye. <laughs> you know. But she said, but let's figure out what we can do and let's get in a taxi and go over to the Armory Fair and meet Karin Sonder, an artist who was based in Berlin who, make, who was making 3D scans of visitors to the Armory. Yes, so, so she made replicas. So again, I always love redefining, well, what's an assumption of what is a portrait? And so for me as a sculptor, I really couldn't resist maybe making a portrait and proposing the idea that, well, what if my portrait was a three-dimensional photographic process still, but um, a three-dimensional photograph? So that's, and you were completely game. Oh, and yeah. off we went I'm to the armory. I'm always game to experiment with and, um, and I didn't have to get flatbed digitally <laughs> scanned <laughs> down to the pores on my face, which is like, no, that's right. not going to happen. <laughs> but what's, what's so amazing when I watch young students respond to the portrait in the gallery, our educators have a series of questions. And they have said, what is this made of? And the students say, stone, clay. Uh, what is that? You know, and they can yeah. start questioning. And then they, the educators ask, who is Maya Lin based on this sculpture? And they say, well, she's serious. She's confident. She's focused. And I thought, now that's the magic of somebody who's got a clear vision of who they are and helps us commission a portrait that teaches our visitors who they are through the portrait. So... Thank yeah. you, Maya, you're, for that you're, gift. And you're welcome. Thank you to Karin Sander. So when we were on the way to the Armory Art Fair, I uh, found myself stuck in some traffic with Maya Lynn, and I asked her questions about her life. And I learned in that conversation that she was working on a redesign at the time of the Smith College Nielsen Library. And that's uh, my alma mater, so I was very interested in that. And then she told me her mother had escaped communist China on a fishing boat with $20 sewn into her clothing and her acceptance letter to Smith oh. sewn into her clothing. I thought that's yeah. fascinating. So I asked you to All tell about, me about yeah, your no, mother. It's, um, yeah, she, was, uh, she had spent two years in college in China and her, my grandfather, who I never met, I never met any of my grandparents, um, he was a, uh, in. they lived in Shanghai, and he was a eye doctor, eye surgeon, actually. So he had come out to the States, and he had many colleagues, because he, he had taken seminars and studied. And um, I think it was Dr. Schwartzman said, if you can get Julia out of China, I'll get her a scholarship. And so Smith had accepted her, and she and a girlfriend, Shirley Ling, who was a classically trained pianist, off they went in probably one of the last boats to leave Shanghai Harbor. The nationalists and the communists were bombing each other. And they actually got caught on a little island off of the coast. And because the nationalists were afraid that young people might be spies. So they were held there for a few months. And they were lucky to get out. This one lieutenant sort of help them get out. And then, so my mother got to Smith a couple months later. And so when I was actually doing the library at Smith, and I'm now I can't remember, I actually went and I visited um, the house she was in and her room. So it was really great. Sadly, she had passed away 
by the time I was really working on it. But um, in a way, I, I owe so much to, um, to Smith, because like, poof, like you kind of have this feeling, well, I wouldn't be here if it were not for right. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a strong She was strong, woman. but she was also very soft. I mean, she was probably um, a very gentle soul. And my kids, my girls, who are very strong, would say, <laughs> not like you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> but Got I, a little bit more of my dad in me. I think I have a little bit of that. But strong in the sense that she encouraged oh. you to have a career um, and that she treated you and your brother, Ton. I think it was it's parallel. Similar, I yeah. think both my parents, um, academics, were really believed in us as people to follow mm -hmm. our pursuits and to do what we loved doing, which was a little atypical. So it wasn't just my mom. In fact, my dad at times would say, oh, she's, my, she's gonna be president of the United States. Not many fathers are saying that about their girls. I had no interest in politics, but um, I don't know. I was stubborn and strong or whatever, so I think that carried. But I think both of them, and I think growing up in academia, we were in a bubble about you were really, it was what you were thinking and what you were doing that mattered. It's all that mattered. It left me both um, uh, with a feeling, and I think my brother too, that we could do anything as long mm -hmm. as we were kind of passionate about what it was, but at the same time a little bit naive about how the world operates and mm -hmm. looks at you, which, you know, I learned a lesson when I got here. Well, and you were able to, as a child, be free in nature, uh, you know, explore yeah. the woods around your home, yeah. play among the mossy um, banks. It's a, it's a beautiful, it was a house surrounded by woods. I think there was a picture, and there's a picture in the show, right? Yeah. Uh, no one would come down the driveway at Halloween, which made us very sad. We'd always have our, <laughs> we'd always have our candy, and there would be no one to come because it was a very scary, just the trees had fall, fallen in, and it was just, a, it was like Hansel and Gretel. It was beautiful. There were deer everywhere, there were raccoons. Um, I kind of would sit in the front lawn, and I almost got so I could hand tame <laughs> Or the rabbits. It was, it was, you know, it was idyllic. It was a little Hansel and Gretel type situation um, in a funny way. But it was also like I'm growing up in Athens, Ohio, and I don't quite fit in, but I don't quite know that I don't fit in. So well, I'm curious you know. about that because you said your family was the only Chinese family yeah. in Athens. Yeah, and I think um, there are things that maybe, um, you know, things would happen that I'd be on the, like, I went to the lab school for the, college till sixth grade and then when I went into the public school system and I had grades for the first time and then I would take the school bus. Uh, Athens High School was uh, a county high school mm -hmm. so it gathered all the local towns. So I was on the first shift for the school bus. There were three shifts so I had to get down to the school bus stop by 6.30 in the morning. We had to run about a mile and a half down the hill. It was like, I don't know why we didn't just bike down to the heart of the hill, <laughs> walk our bike, but no, we ran down to the hill. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I didn't, again, this is this bubble I'm in. Thank, I think my brother was in less of a bubble. He's older. But like, okay, so they put gum in my hair, and my mom had to cut all the gum out, or they'd do other things like mm -hmm. that. But at the time, I didn't realize they were kind of making fun of me. So that bubble, in a way, protected me. Like, I'll never forget, like at the very first press conference in DC, some reporter said, well, don't you think it's ironic that this is a memorial uh, to an Asian war and you're of Asian descent? And I just remember looking at him going, well, that's completely irrelevant. <laughs> and then it was about nine months later when I asked the Vietnam veterans fund, um, who were building it, the VVMF, has my race been an issue and they were like, they didn't want to tell me, they were protective. And I, there is a side of me that probably has throughout my life undergone um, certain amounts of racism and bullying and I'm a little bit in my own bubble head so it doesn't sort of like, it protects me a little bit. Well and you've described it to me in conversations as a kind of an innocence. 
it's it, or stupidity. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it, my brother's like, oh, why? You know, he, you know didn't you realize? Um, I, no, it just didn't occur to me at the time. I was sort of busy, do, focused, and angry about other things, like obsessive about design, or a, I'm obsessive about certain things. But happily, I think it did protect me a lot about um, just being in a little bit of that protective bubble. Right. Well, and, and at Yale, and you see the, the, the boards that oh, yeah. were submitted to the competition, um, you were inspired by your professor, Ben Scully, um, to, it, to come up with a statement. Yeah, it's a funny with. thing. So this, I, I sat, my dad was dean of fine arts at OU, so it wasn't like this, the art that I do and the, the pot that is of my father's, you know, we were sending a man to the moon. So my dad was making all these like clay, topographic, almost lunar forms. In fact, the front face of the School of the Art are, was like his two panels. And um, anyway, I lost my thread. I don't know where I was on that one. Sorry. Like the, like the inspiration oh, for the, but, the so statement. So he had a show up. Yeah. I went home for like Christmas break or something. Um, or, and there was a show up at the gallery at Ohio University, Trisolini Gallery. And it was Scandinavian design. And I, I just plunked myself down. And I think what was like the Arne Jacobsen egg chair. Or was it the, or this other one? I always switch the names. And I'm sitting in this chair and I'm going, I have to go to Denmark to study architecture. But Yale didn't have a, a junior term abroad. And I was like obsessed with going to Denmark um, for my junior year. And at the time, you didn't do that. It was only on, it was 1980, 1980. And you had to prove that what you wanted to study wasn't taught at Yale. <laughs> Danish is not taught at Yale. So this is a long story as to the start of this. So I get to Denmark to study architecture. Um, no, Danish, sorry. I actually were in Danish. Yeah, I hate their ekedans. And then I'm given a part of Copenhagen that has the largest cemetery. And um, I, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful park because in Europe, space is of the essence and cemeteries are also doubling as these beautiful places to go to. So I got very interested and then so when I get back to Yale and then I go through Europe and I study, I, I look at all these different cemeteries, not because I'm morbid, but I just was got sort of interested in it. And so had I not gone to Denmark, I never would have kind of it wouldn't have piqued my interest. And so I get back and a classmate of mine is going, oh, there's a seminar, a senior seminar at Yale on funereal architecture. And it was like, wow, that sounds great. So I actually designed, <laughs> I know, but it's not out of morbidity, it's about this need to like understand our own mortality. I kind of got very interested in how like Europe and a lot of older cultures really mourn. They're not afraid to mourn, they're not afraid to accept aging, and we're a really young culture, so we're afraid. We're like, no, we're gonna put that away, we're gonna put old people away, we're gonna put aging away. We're afraid of it. So this was all in my, the back of my head. And so it was a tiny seminar. There were maybe nine of us, and there were um, projects to design a, a cemetery gate. There was a, a memorial to World War III, which got me studying all about memorials. And the final project, one of us saw a poster for a competition. And we said, wow, what a perfect way to end the semester. And so it was around Thanksgiving. And we all decided, about five of us decided to come to Washington on our way back from Thanksgiving break and meet in Washington and look at the site. And, uh, um, and that's the famous mashed potato stories. We go see the site. I had studied memorials for like, okay, three weeks, two <laughs> weeks maybe. And, and I come back in. And, and my process hasn't changed. You do a lot of research, you do a lot of research, you put it all away, and you just make something with your hands. So I always say, you think through your hands. And you're thinking, it's just that you're not verbally describing and defining what you do. I think a very big difference between art and architecture is, in architecture, you have to get up and you have to present your building. 
or your design, and you have to actually explain kind of why you do what you do. Can you imagine a painter getting up and saying, well, I made that mark because of this reason, and I made that mark because of this reason. So they're two very, very, very different um, creative forces that they're tapping into, both equally hard, equally creative, but really, really different. So I've always said broken record. Um, creating architecture is like writing a novel, right. and making art is like writing a poem for me. And that's literally, and I love both of them. Um, but that's how it all starts. Yeah. So I make, just as a backstory, the memorial I made for World War III <laughs> was a terrifying, painful endeavor <laughs> that was like a blue half sphere and you walked into it and the half, the whole sphere was buried below and you took four random stairways in, the walls were very sharp, you get to the kind of the, you descend into it and then you get to look out into darkness and then you have to come back up. And um, oh, my professor was so upset with me. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, if I had a brother who died in that war, I would never want to visit. And I'm like, Andy, it's World War III. <laughs> We're not gonna be here. So I think we had really different ideas of why he was teaching the course and I was taking the course. Right. And um, <laughs> it, it just came out. And the last piece was I designed the memorial, like we all did. And, um, and then, I don't know, the next semester, I decided to enter it because I believed I wanted to send it out, not to win, of course not to win, to make a statement, because um, I believed in it. And then Vincent Scully was talking about uh, a memorial, I was taking a seminar with him. He was my, I was his head TA for my three years in grad school. I really, if you're an undergrad at Yale, um, he's one of, he was one of the great teachers. He would bring you to tears. He would take you from Teotihuacan to Monticello to the skyscrapers in Manhattan. And you'd be just crying your eyes out because he really made architecture human. And there were two things that I really learned in architecture which has sort of framed me. It's the humanist quality mm -hmm. of what the built world can give us. And from Vincent Scully, it was all about how cities and buildings can shape how we feel. And from Denmark, it was, there were these core books. Um, Rasmussen was one, and it was all about Almost, it was almost like early sociology, behavioral sciences. How can a building make you feel? Mm. Now, by the time you get to architecture after in the 80s and 90s, it's much more um, theoretical. Right. And I'm still of that earlier era. I'm very interested in the psychology of spaces. Yeah. And that's sort of where this whole piece comes from. But so Vincent talks about this journey through the Lechens Memorial, Tiepval, and he's talking about a journey to an awareness about death. You're left in the center of this archway that is a way takes its shape from what was a burned out church in the, in the town proper, and all the names of the missing are listed on the archway, and it is an astronomical number of um, the missing because there were no dog tags, you couldn't identify the bodies. And then you're left looking out on a simple cemetery of crosses for the British, um, headstones for the French, or it might be vice versa, and you, then you have to turn around. So it's a, it brings you to an awareness of death and loss, and then you have to turn around. And he's talking about this, and I'm going, oh my god, that's what my piece has done. It's a journey to an awareness of death, and then you have to face the light. You have to go back out. And, um, and so I'm furiously writing. And he's looking at me like, what are you doing, Maya? <laughs> and that becomes the essay that I think really catches, that really yeah. catches the jury. Um, and you had such a strong conviction about the design and, and the um, psychological aspects of the design, including the chronological names. Yes. And the beauty of it is, yeah. and again, it's a, you always like to think, um, so there were no fax machines back then. There were no cell phones back then. My brother, who's a poet, who was also equally influential in who I am, because in a way, my parents were like kind of 
kind of clueless. Like <laughs> once my brother and I were in the elevator of OU Lib uh, Art School, and it goes, Henry Wynn is gay. And my, our dad looks and says, oh, what does that mean? And we looked at him and said, it means you're really happy. Because <laughs> they, they just didn't know certain things. Yeah, not that, yeah. you know, and, um, and so my brother would like start putting poetry books in front of me. Like first it was like, I think it was W.S. Merwin and then John Ashbery and then he'd do Wall Stevens. So in a way my brother was a, my, one of my early influencers as well. So I'm reading him by phone what I've written because I'm about to hand write it on the drawings, those pastel drawings, at which point the jurors are going to, one of them is going to say, he must really know what he's doing to dare to do something so naive. It's like, no, just an undergraduate making pastels. Um, <laughs> but the writing, which you'll notice there's actually white out and ink, I read it to my brother and he helped me edit it as we were by phone. So he is actually, he's got the draft copy of it. I gave that to him because it was just, again, these are like these wild. Right. I mean, you look at your wife and you go, had I not sat in that chair right. in Athens, Ohio, the egg chair, I'm pretty sure it was the egg chair. I, I wouldn't be sitting right. here today. But you talk about this beautiful development of the concept and the mentors and the family all of these people sort of helping yeah. bring it to fruition. Yeah. And you get to Washington as a 21-year-old, and you're faced with a lot. Yeah. And you stood up for yourself throughout it. You, you stayed true to the design. But I think that's the interesting thing. That's where, if you could remember back to when you were 21, what did you think? You're fearless. Yeah. Youth gives you a protect, another protective bubble. You're fearless. And who had read The Fountainhead? Who believed, right, in, right, who right. believed in Howard work? Who thought one of her first big heroes was Frank Lloyd Wright? Well, and you so wore you a were pork pie right. hat. You oh, kind of embodied God. Frank Lloyd Wright well, and that, used it to hide your eyes from the press. Yeah, you my, were so fierce No, I was, I, I, was, I, I was, I think, idealistic beyond belief and happily naive. How's that? I love that. A lesson to all of the young people here, especially <laughs> but, young women, but, but, because you were yeah. up against an army of men. And some of the men stood with you, and some did not. And you got through it. And then, so what I want to get to here is how do you, you do something so extraordinary? You have fought for yourself. You're only 21. And then where do you go from there? I mean, um, we're, and now uh, that was again really easy because again I was an undergrad when I did it, so I actually my graduation day I actually had to f drive get driven down to D.C. and start the first kind of battle was to make sure there was a really decent lands an architect of record who had built landscape integrated solutions. There was no question in my mind. I spent eight months in D.C. <laughs> And I was not going to let it sidetrack me from what my wife normally would have been. So I didn't take any time out. I had already applied to graduate school. In fact, I went to the Harvard GSD in the fall of 1982 and was trying to go through graduate school. And I'll never forget, I had a paper due for the GSD, an art architecture history paper. I'm getting up for the f to catch the first shuttle back to Boston, um, having testified to Congress um, to try to get the statues from being in the absolute apex to push them out. I actually only had a couple allies. Nobody would touch me um, with the 10-foot pole. Um, it, you know, it was like, it was controversial. It was right. it was one of those things. The the veterans fought for it. Now the fund, the Vietnam Memorial Fund, fought for it. And Judith Martin's in the audience, and her dear friend Wolf, were real protectors of me and the design. And I think Jay Carter Brown was also incredibly protective. So the the there were people. The Fine Arts Commission community was very protective. <laughs> But it was not a time to be in graduate school. So as I sit there and I'm like having my little croissant 
on the plane trying to write my paper. I'm going, not the time to be in graduate school. So then I, I take the rest of the year off, and then I immediately reapply. I've reapplied to Yale, because I figured I'm going to go back to New Haven. Not that I like New Haven, but I really like Yale. And, um, <laughs> and kind of pretend that that didn't happen. I'm going to go on and pursue my career, my mm -hmm. path, because this was an anomaly. Washington was crazy. And, um, and yeah, the pork pie hat saved my life, because I could, I could turn my head down, and I, I didn't, they couldn't photograph my face. And all the ca during the testifying, it was just weird. And right. I would be me and my lawyers and nobody else. It was like literally, because I was trying to push the statues out of the apex, because they were taller right. than the memorial. It would have been just a disaster. And, and, and you know, everyone's like, well, we've built it. It's going to be fine. It's OK to have an addition there. It's like, and I'm going, no, it will not be OK to have an addition there. It will completely destroy the, the kind of calm, quiet of the piece. So that was the, the battle that really brought me into just a, a fury with, um, because I think people, I think there had been an article that came out by, was it Tom Wolf, And it was about how these elitist intellectual yellies are um, <laughs> telling telling you know the veterans what they should feel and I, that I'm, I I don't care about them, and it was that was really hurtful because um, that was really hurtful. Anyway, um, so I got back to Yale, Memorial gets dedicated, and proceeded to kind of I think at Yale it was very interesting. Um, I was pretty much given a loving choice by one of my professors who really cared about me. Um, well, you, you, got, you got to make a choice, Maya. You, you can't do art and architecture. You have to make a choice. And I went, really? And I didn't think much of it. Mm -hmm. But my entire life, being the daughter of two creative souls and my you know, I was casting bronzes by the time I was in. Um, in high school, right. and I was always making things. There's no way I was going to choose. So I have sort of danced between the architectural projects, the art projects, both the small-scale works that I can make by myself in my studio, and the large-scale earthworks that are 11 acres large, and you need bulldozers to do it. And then I really was, I have said yes to the fifth and final of the memorials is what is missing for, um, you know, just it's a piece focused on the one issue that as a child I've always cared about, which is the environment. So the three or the tripod, I didn't make a choice, but the choice I did make, and my entire staff is here today. Can you guys just raise you? your hands? There's Yay. four of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Milan Studio, uh, a group of architects and artists always trained and one person working on what is missing. I stay really small. I've always had less than five people working for me, generally three to five, um, because I don't really delegate. So everyone who works with me, they work and they help me build one project. So it's a one-on-one. -on -one. And the things that I've done is I generally take on one architecture project at a time in order f to be able to execute and work on the artworks. And then missing, oh my god, missing, um, I started it in 2007. It's this cr crazy guerrilla art project. Um, the website just got revamped. But can you imagine putting out a website as a sketchbook that kept changing? It's like, no, this is not finished. This is just the repository. It got revamped in time for this it, it show. It got revamped so for Dorothy's show. You. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please go to whatismissing.org. Um, the only thing we ask of you is to share a memory. It's very easy to do on the website. So it's both a collective memory of what we're losing, trying to make it personal, and how does nature relate to you personally, but also gives you um, interactive mapping solutions as to how you could make a difference. But also, what can an artist do to maybe change how we think about the problem? So just to put it in perspective, if the World Economic Forum says it would take 1.6 trillion annually to curb, to mitigate climate change, 
you might say that seems like a lot of money, or you could say, well, that's what we spend on alcohol every <laughs> year. So everyone thinks you're going to go to defense. No, 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 no. Have another drink for the planet. I'm not telling you not to take that drink. Have another drink. Help the planet out. So it's like literally what can art do at times? I think it can get us to look at the problems we face maybe in a new light, mm -hmm. hopefully with a sense of humor because I think we need it right now. And, um, and um, like you know, at Eastern time, we send out this really cute picture of a rabbit and we ask you a question. What does a rabbit have in common with the Mississippi River? Anyone want to answer the question? Uh. Um, if we all substituted rabbit meat for, for beef, we would save enough water equivalent to what used to flow down the entire Mississippi River. But if you read the reports this year, the Mississippi River kind of turned into a mud flat towards its estuary end. But it's, it's literally getting us to rethink what the problems are that we face. And maybe, maybe in the end, that's all I can do as an artist, is to maybe get us to ha have hope, because we, right. we, could, we, we could get ourselves well, out of this. And I, you've given us hope here, watching what's happening with your interactive. We have not done this kind of interactive before, where we ask visitors to write something and tack it on the wall. And, you know, in a federal bureaucracy, we have to be careful about sort of, you know, how much freedom we give and who yeah. can monitor these things. Visitors are so moved by this, and the response we're getting is so meaningful. And the young people are really, they sit on the floor and they write their memories, and I've talked to them, and some have broken down into tears talking about what they remember that has changed in their grandfather's village or in a place that's right. important to their and, family. And I think, you know, we thought, talk about scientific evidence-based science is always, like, it has to be reported. But if you think about, like, the Christmas bird count and you talk about citizen science, our anecdotal observations give us, again, windows back in time. So if a child, and we've taken this to school curriculums, high schools are great, kids get to go interview their parents and their grandparents. Because again, here's a fundamental fact about losing, if we're in the sixth extinction in the planet's history um, of species and the only one to be caused by a species, um, how do we protect it if we don't even realize it's missing? So one of the very first facts I came across is that birds, uh, a lot of songbirds, are in a 50 to 90% decline. So literally, the sounds we all heard as children of songbird is missing. But we don't know it because it's shifting baselines. We get to know what we know in our moment in time. So we also have created these in-depth, like 200-point timelines of rivers, of cities, of species that take you back in time to, we just had Thanksgiving. You might not know the American wild turkey was almost hunted out of existence. And it was this one scientist who came up with a way to do a trap that shot the net over the birds. And so we tell this story at Thanksgiving to basically, a lot of times, you know, we'll focus on people lived by places that were massively abundant. First, we pollute them to the point you know, the Thames River is in there with the big stink that shuts down Parliament for the first time. And then you, lo and behold, first it's um, human waste, then it's industrial pollution, and then we become very aware of what we're doing. We start regulating, we start putting in laws. Nature's resilient. If we give it a chance, it comes back. And this arc to, you know, of recovery is right. where where we want to go, if we really want to emphasize there is a lot of good going on, we have to move much faster on climate change. And to me, and here's another thing I'm hoping, um, I say we can save two birds with one tree. 50% of all emissions is caused by habitat degradation and loss, ranching, farming, and by um, changing and reforming our ag, our ranching, protecting and restoring our forests, wetlands, glass, grasslands, we can both preserve and save biodiversity as well as potentially absorb, if you go by the TNC's stats and by drawdown, 50 to 
90% of all man-made emissions could be absorbed, like soil, if we bring back the life of soil, that goes from being a carbon emitter to being a carbon sink. So we go through all this, but again, give me another year, give Casey and I another year. Um, the website's up, but the solutions and the what we call green print right. is still to need some editing. So we're still and, a work and in you're progress. still as you develop the content online, you're still creating installations like Ghost Forest. Ghost Forest was both an artwork. Twenty, um, yeah, twenty twenty one was an insane year, but. Um, Smith opened, and it's one of the greenest libraries, energy efficiency-wise, to open in this country. And then paralleling it was um, Ghost Forest, which I brought 50 uh, Atlantic cedars that had been killed by saltwater inundation due to rising seas into the heart of downtown Manhattan. And then we proceeded to have forums and discussions where we brought artists in with the Nature Conservancy and with um, the Rodale Institute, which has done the great studies on agriculture, you know, um, no-till organic farming, and like Edwina von Gaal, whose whole focus is on what can you do in your own backyard to bring back biodiversity. So here's another fun fact. Um, what's the largest irrigated crop grown in America? Yes and it's completely toxic if you're using the fertilizers. And so, so then we link to groups like the Perfect Earth Project, which tells you how you can make your yard toxin-free. And you know, I don't know if you've played the game of Go. If you can win the border, mm -hmm. that's a lot of area. So just eat away at your lawn and let it go back to nature. Talk to your... Um, experts who can bring back native plants so that you can actually, I think her new, Edwina uh, is one of my best friends, um, one of her new projects is called Two Thirds for the Birds. <laughs> and it, it's great, so go, go to her websites as well. But we only ask it missing, share a memory with us, and it could be something about something that's been lost, something, it's even better if you remember a story that your grandparents told you. Um, because again, we can go back in time, and in a way we have to, not to depress ourselves, but to realize how much we've lost. Well, and I think what you really realize is you're losing magic. You're using those, Wonder. losing those, yeah. the wondrous Wonder. moments, the fireflies, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the sounds of the birds, yeah. um, you know, the way that the just, seasons change. Just light, change. like, you know. Light pollution is huge, and it's like, when was the last time you get a clear picture of the night sky? Right. The like stars. these are all things that are things that we all probably, if you're older, um, then you remember. Like, oh wow, what? And I think, I think the key with what we do, what I try to do with missing, is just emphasize nature's resilient, and if we give it a chance, it can come back and it can also help reduce emissions by so much. So it's like save two birds with one tree, and if you save a wetland, wetland you save three birds, because we also protect ourselves from rising seas. So this is, these are images of the newly revamped mobile version. Um, but it's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, Maya, you're cha you're literally changing the world. You're you're no, an artist I'm not, who is I'm not, no. I'm not, well, I'm you're not, asking. Not, not. Uh, you're calling us to action mm, mm. to change the world with you. Yeah. So the the wonderful thing about this particular one life is that usually these exhibitions are focused on a subject who's not alive. Usually someone no longer <laughs> living. So Maya was in a panic when we were working on this about being the, you know, yeah. no, no, no. I didn't a living tell subject. anyone. Right. She was panicked. I was convinced. The show opened September 30th right. and I wouldn't say anything to anyone because I was like, I'm going to jinx it. I'm going to jinx it. It's like, I've got three more days. I have to live another. I was convinced. <laughs> I was going to get run over. Something bad was going to happen. It's like, knock on wood. I was like, no, no, no. And I hope you have more living subjects, so because I don't yeah. want to be the only one in this <laughs> in this genre. Well, um, I I mean the the thing about this particular one life too is it doesn't have portrait after portrait after portrait of the person. So when I started talking to Maya about this exhibition, and I had to convince her that it was okay 
to focus on her because she's a very private person. Her work is public, but she likes to be private. And so I, I convinced you, I think, when I said that it's for the young people. Um, the story <laughs> of your, your, you're such an inspiration. Um, and the story of your resilience, of your extraordinary career in art, architecture, and in memory works um, is one that needs to be told. So the exhibition is not portraits, it's Maya's projects, because her projects are a portrait of her. And the final piece, the installation of what is missing, which is an interactive, yeah. brings us all into the picture with her. Um, which is what she does, from going back to the Vietnam Memorial where there's that personal connection, a sense of community, um, a shared purpose, and let's consider the cost of war, to yeah. let's consider the cost of biodiversity right. and what we're losing. Yeah, but it's also what's interesting about all the, the works that I do, they're very <laughs> private, they're personal. Um, the Vietnam Memorial, like nobody figures this one out. What what size is the text on the memorial? It's less than half an inch. And so what does that mean? It means we're putting a book out in public. And if you put a book out in public, it's very different than putting a billboard out. So if you put a billboard out, you're talking at a much larger audience. But if you put a book out, each individual has to read it as an individual. And I think missing, no matter how many iterations it might have, and it's what if you could make a memorial be like water and it could flow wherever mm. it's invited in. It's free as long as you share it. Um, and so the intimacy of asking people to share a memory and become a part of the memorial, something that they personally connect to, what makes nature, what is important to them about nature? So it's not like an abstract, because we all grew up with the natural world. And we're, as, as kids, we're all fascinated by it. And then we kind of get a little older, we get a little more jaded. We kind of forget, or we know what it is, and we know we're going to be preached to. And I'm hoping I'm not preaching through it, because that's been always a huge driver in practically everything I've done. I'm just going to put out pointed facts, but I'm going to let you come draw your own conclusions from it. Because the minute I start telling you what to do, so my greatest fear with missing was it was going to become too didactic. So we try to pose everything as a question to engage you rather than a declarative. So. What does a rabbit have in common with the Mississippi <laughs> River? Or I won't say, don't eat meat, but we do say, well, if we all ate 20% less beef, right. that would free up enough land that is equivalent to all the protected land in North America and half the protected land in South America. And it's not, you're not didactic. One of the things I love about working with you is you're a great teacher. You're a great, in a way, just Thanks. a great educator. <laughs> and I've partnered with our audience engagement team on this exhibition yeah. to make what is missing happen. So I'm grateful to all our educators. I've never seen an exhibition that is so um, meaningful to young people in terms of getting them to talk. Um, and so really, at the core of all this, you're a, a great teacher. Thanks. And that is, to me, the greatest gift to have you out in the world. Um, teaching us how to live better, to live more intentionally, um, and also teaching us how to um, live a life of purpose. And Thank you. I think my mother did that. My oh. mother, I'll get back to my mother. It's like, I, I, <laughs> you did it. And I, she really made it very clear to us. Um, what would be bad is if you didn't do something that followed what your passion was, but also this absolute need to, um, to give back. Just, just it's part of who she was. Thank you, Maya. You're welcome. All right.